So this video is all going to be about electromagnetic induction. I'm not going to look at generators and rotational motion in this video. I'm going to do that separately in a subsequent video because I think it's a very different thought process and different equations you're using. So I'm going to focus on linear motion in this. So the first thing we need to know about is Fleming's right-hand rule. So if it's about induction, it's right-hand rule. If it's the force on a conductor, it's the left-hand rule. So we're going to use the right-hand rule here. And so it's in the same format as the other way. So first finger is still your field, the field. Uh, your second finger gives you the direction of conventional current or the direction of the EMF induced. And the thumb it gives is the motion of the of the device that's causing the induction. So if you're dropping a magnet, it's the force or the motion of that magnet. And so remembering that this is conventional current, so it's the flow of positive charge, or sometimes if it's not connected to an incomplete circuit, it will just be an ENF induced, but it still gives you an idea of the direction. So that's Fleming's right-hand rule. So let's move on to the laws that govern the electromagnetic induction. So when we talk about electromagnetic induction, we always talk about the EMF induced because sometimes the EMF can be induced in something that's not a conductor. Like So an EMF is always induced whether a current flows or not is dependent on the material in which the EMF is induced. First of all, let's have a look at Faraday. This is a law derived by Michael Faraday, who is working on this. And what he says is that EMF is proportional to the rate of change of flux linkage. So on the top line, we have the delta, so change in N times the flux. So that's your flux linkage there. And on the bottom, obviously, delta T. And this equation takes many forms depending on what the problem looks like. And I'll show you in the work example how that works. So once Faraday had done that, he then moved had his work continued by a scientist called Lenz. And what Lenz's law says is that any EMF or current induced will act to oppose the motion that created it. So if you induce a current in a wire, the magnetic field around that current will act in such a way as to oppose the motion that created it. And you will see lots of examples of this as you work through the topic. So let's have a look at these in practice. So, it tells you that a 0.5 meter square sheet of metal is thrown at a 5 meters per second parallel to the ground, and so it's perpendicular to the magnetic, magnetic field of the Earth, which is 3.1 times 10 to the minus 5. Oh, we had yet another formatting error on this. And just to clarify what I meant by this 0.5 meter square, as uh, that I'm meaning this sort of square. So if we draw a diagram of what this looks like, we've got this sheet of material going that way through a magnetic field, which looks something like that. So we want to work out what the EMF induced in it is. And we know that the EMF is going to be proportional to the rate of change of flux linkage there. Now, first things first is one sheet. So that tells us N equals one. So already we've got it into so just the rate of change of flux. There's nothing to do with linkage. So let's try substituting in the flux. So we know that flux is the flux density multiplied by the area. And the flux density is not going to change because it's the Earth. So we can take the B out of the delta. So D delta C. I wrote a T there. So it's going to be your rate of change of area over time. And this quantity, delta A delta T, is called the swept 
out area quite a lot. So a lot of the questions are due with the flux in aeroplanes, wings, and that type of thing. And when it talks about swept out area, it means delta A delta T. So let's have a look at what the swept out area will be. So if we look slightly up to the top right, we've got a frontal length of 0.5 meters. And in one second, it's going to sweep out an area. This is why it's called the swept out area. And because it's going at 5 meters per second, that in one second, that length will be 5. So that means that the rate of change of area with the rate of time is going to be 0.5 multiplied by the 5 per second. So 5 is 2.5 meters squared per second. So let's substitute that back into here. So B, we were told, was 3.1, 10 to the minus 5 times by our swept out area, which is equal to 7.8 volts, because it's an EMF. So I gave that I gave that answer to two significant figures. I think the actual came out seven point seven five. But obviously, it wouldn't be appropriate to give any more significant figures there. So that would be the magnitude of EMF induced in the sheet of metal. So let's look at a slightly different example. So in this situation, what we have is we have a magnet north pole facing down, which is dropped through this coil of n turns and then afterwards obviously it falls out of the coil and goes on in its travel. So important things to think about, we've dropped this magnet so if we say it's traveling at V2 here and V1 here we know that V2 is going to be greater than V1 because of the effect of gravity and that's important to remember for later on. So what's going to happen is this magnet is going to go through the coil. So we're going to get mag we're going to get flux cutting going on. So we're going to get an EMF induced in the coil. And if it's a complete circuit, which I'm going to say for this example it is, so let's connect up the loose ends. Then we're going to get a current flowing in the circuit. And what Lenz's law tells us is that the current will be induced in such a way as to oppose the force that's creating it. So if we look at this section up here at the top, this north pole is falling towards this coil. So as an EMF and a current start to be induced in the coil, it's going to act to oppose that magnet. So that means as it falls towards it, a north pole is going to be induced in the top of this coil to try and basically prevent the magnet or oppose the motion that's creating it. Now if we go to the bottom here, after it falls out, then it's going to try and oppose it again. So to attract a south pole or pull back, a north pole would have to be induced there at the bottom. So at some point the current has to change direction because at one point it must be going one direction to induce the north pole in the top and then at some point it has to change over so it's going the opposite direction to induce the north pole at the bottom of the coil and that's going to be important we try and sketch this graph of how the EMF changes over time. So let's have a look at that now. So when it's really far away there is no flux cutting there so the EMF at time zero when it's really far away is going to be zero and the EMF is going to start to increase as it towards it and it will hit a maximum value just as it crosses into the coil. Now at this point you're going to start inducing uh, an, a sort of, a, you think about it, an inverse EMF so they're going to start to cancel each other, so you're going to get two starting to cancel each other out as you get the effect from the bottom here and on the top as well and the bottom one was originally start off smaller but then keep increasing until they're equal to. So at some point you'll hit 
where, when basically the two currents or EMFs induced uh, opposing ends start to cancel each other out. And then what you'll get is this one will start to increase. And then, like before, as it gets to a long distance away, eventually EMF reduces to zero. Now, as you can see here, this peak is bigger than this peak. Why? It's to do with this that I talked about earlier. If it's traveling faster at the bottom end of the coil, the rate of flux cutting is going to be greater, so then the EMF induced is going to be greater. So you'd expect to see a bigger peak for the second one. And again, like I said, because you've got an changing from inducing a north pole on the top to a north pole on the bottom, you're going to have the EMF basically it must change direction at some point in the travel, which is why you end up with a graph like this. And in terms of observations, because you've had a force acting upwards, you would expect an acceleration of less than g. So you'd expect it to take if you drop this and alongside one that wasn't in a coil, you'd expect it to hit the ground afterwards because the resultant force is no longer just the field strength of the Earth's gravity, it's also got an upward force from the magnetic field.